Welcome to Vitality Made Simple. This is episode 89, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Thomas Levy. Before I give him the mic, I want to tell you about Dr. Levy. Um, we met initially in 2018 uh, when he was launching the book that we're going to talk about. This is an incredible book called The Hidden Epidemic. I recommend that uh, everybody read it. It should be required reading in all medical schools and all dental schools. Um, Dr. Levy uh, has an incredible number of, like, I, I, I counted your uh, references, and I think it was like almost 500 references in this book. But Dr. Thomas Levy graduated from uh, Tulane Medical School with honors in 1978. Then he went on to uh, later graduate from Denver College of Law in 1998. He is a board certified cardiologist and a bar certified attorney. He's now focusing his energy on ed educating both physicians and the public. Uh, he's written six books, countless articles uh, on health-related issues that will help people restore and maintain vibrant health You know, in the face of all these different forms of toxicity that we're facing in our world. Um, I, I admire Dr. Levy so much for all of his accomplishments. Um, but I think what I admire most, Dr. Levy, is your curiosity and your bravery at getting this message out. Um, he's fearless in presenting relevant, actionable, and research-based information. So it's just a pleasure to be with you today, Dr. Levy. Um, I'm confident that we're all going to benefit greatly from your vast knowledge and your brave curiosity. Welcome. Thank you, Debbie. It's a pleasure to be here. I might add, it's kind of funny uh, with the book you're talking about, Hidden Epidemic. Probably, if I had been a little more clear-headed at the time and realized how widespread it is, I'd have entitled it Hidden Pandemic rather than Hidden Epidemic. I totally agree. Um, and like it's at the base of every other problem. And uh, even, you know, this book totally outlines that, but I'm seeing it every single day in my clinical practice. And, and I'm astounded that it's not on the news, <laughs> you know, like it should be, this should be what dominates the news rather than other things that we're hearing. Uh, you know, we met in uh, 2018 at the American, Col um, American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, and you were a standout to me because, um, I was sort of the, you know, oddball dentist there and to see a physician with a book, uh, that the cover is a dental x-ray. Oh my goodness. My heart leapt <laughs> and I have your signed copy here and I just treasure it. Uh, I don't loan this book out to anybody because it's, it's like a reference book for, for me. And, uh, so, so tell us about how you got interested in the math when you were you know, a prestigious cardiologist. Well, I suppose all that started in about 1993. I was practicing regular old adult cardiology in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is also the home at the time of Dr. Hal Huggins, probably, in my opinion, the most extraordinary forward-minded maverick dentist on the planet. And I shouldn't even say maverick dentist. I should say maverick healthcare practitioner because he was taking care of more things going on in the body by virtue of what he did than any physician I've ever known. And as it turned out, you know, one thing led to another. We got to know each other at a conference we met at in Colorado Springs and he said, well, why don't you come by my clinic and see what we do? And he had a very large clinic, very large staff, and he had literally patients from around the world that would come in for a two-week uh, treatment period. Uh, these were people who mostly had extremely advanced medical conditions, neurological, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you name it as well as things like multiple sclerosis, a lot of that, a lot of people in wheelchairs. And he had a protocol where he addressed the mouth. We called it a total dental revision, where he would take care of all the infected teeth. At that time, it was predominantly root canals, although I think perhaps had we had the technology then that we have now, 
a few more teeth would have come out because we've discovered as we to talk about the hidden epidemic that with the cone beam x-ray examination you detect a whole host of abscessed teeth which are just as toxic if not more than root canals yet they largely go undiagnosed on regular x-ray so anyway dr huggins told me to come by sometime i did and I must confess, I was fascinated in this one particular visit early on. I saw this little old lady in a wheelchair go into the dental operatory. And I just flitted in and out. And I saw she went through about oof, two and a half to three hours of really brutal dental work, extractions and everything imaginable. The type of thing that I like to say, when you take the wisdom teeth out of a college kid, he or she goes to bed for a week is how traumatic the, the work is on the body, right. you know. And as this lady's work went on and on, she started getting more and more animated, more and more energetic. And toward the end of the session, uh, she was asking her caregiver to take her out for a big meal somewhere in Colorado Springs that evening. And she was going to chew on the other side of her mouth because she was just so stoked. And about that time, Hal poked his head into the operatory, and I said, give me a break, Hal. What the heck is going on here? And he pointed to the IV bag. I said, okay, IV, I'm familiar with those, Hal. What's the secret? He said, well, obviously, it's what's in it is the secret, but it's not a secret. The secret is she got 50 grams of vitamin C infused before, during, and after her dental work. And... Mm -hmm. I must say, I'm not in a habit of denying what I witnessed to be happening, or deny what I witnessed with my own eyes. And what I saw happen with this little old, decrepit little old lady, animate and perk up, I immediately said, you know, this is something I need to investigate. And that literally yeah. triggered the moment at which I began pretty much my life's work, uh, 30 years since then now, on researching vitamin C and all the things that it does. Uh, and that, of course, brought me into not only what it does, but what causes the diseases that it helps. So it all sort of evolve a whole right. major picture of not only what helps resolve disease, but quite logically then, if this is resolving the disease and it's doing something to the etiology of what causes diseases. And that brought us to oxidation versus reduction. And so shortly thereafter, I actually just gave up my cardiology practice. Uh, Dr. Huggins invited me to be a medical consultant to his clinic, which I was pleased to do. And then he paid me so well, and I had so much time on my hands. Uh, and I saw how incredibly regularly traumatized he was with legal garbage such oh, that he goodness. had a lawyer on retainer. He had a lawyer on retainer that he paid about $15,000 a month to just to take care of the nonstop stream of crap. Yeah. And somewhere that From triggered the, dental the community. idea. Yeah, uh, dental community. And it's incredible how patients who have been abused by regular medicine for years, seen 15, 20 different doctors, when they come to see somebody outside of that medical community, alternative, complimentary, whatever you want to call, they hold them to a higher standard. They don't dream of suing the garbage mainstream practitioner to put them in the situation they did. But when something comes out less than perfect or less than expected, when they're finally getting bailed out by getting the toxins taken out of their body, uh, they perceive that person to be susceptible. And in that regard, they are because modern quote on modern mainstream medicine has a whole institution behind it it's got the hospitals and the organizations and this side of the other and you're just not as likely to win something legally as when you are going against somebody who is being regarded as not is but is being regarded as being on the fringe okay and anyway i saw all of that and somehow I got this crazy idea then that I needed to go to law school. And 
over the course of three years commuting from Colorado Springs to Denver. I got my law degree. And that pretty much brings the origins of all of this up to snuff. Since then, I haven't practiced any cardiology, but I've done a lot of writing. I'm up to 13 books now. And this is consistently, even now, it's just impressive to me how, even though this was the farthest thing from my mind when all this started back in 1994, it impresses me so much today as to how foundational everything I've learned has turned out to be. I had no idea at the outset that vitamin C, infectious diseases and toxins, which was the name of my vitamin C book, was going to have such broad application. But as it turns out now, uh, through the pandemic, uh, the role of vitamin C and the things that I've promoted for the past 30 years are not only appropriate, but the ideal therapies and what we're dealing with now. So it truly is, and I think it's pretty much discussed in Hidden Epidemic, there's the foundation of disease based on oxidation. And ultra, well, let me, let me just tell you this. Early on, both in my reading and my observations and some docs I interact with, it was very clear, very clear, that a high dose interfusion of vitamin C would neutralize any toxin that you took. It was the ultimate poison antidote. And it was very, very clear, the clinical result. You see sick people get well that uh, if they went to the poison control center, they might not survive. And this troubled me probably for several years when I said, how is it that one substance, vitamin C, can reverse the poisoning of literally many thousands of different agents, all with different chemical compositions, different molecules, different properties. And the only obvious conclusion was all of those diverse toxins have to have a final common pathway of exerting their toxicity. And it's that final common pathway that vitamin C blocks and reverses. And that's where it comes into oxidation. All toxins, 100%, ultimately inflict their damage in the body by oxidizing critical biomolecules, meaning they take electrons away from them. And in the course of that, when the biomolecule is oxidized, losing an electron, it either becomes less active or completely inactive. So you oxidize an enzyme and you completely lose the enzymatic function. You can clearly see how that fits into pathology. But the even bigger point that I finally came to realize is we see a lot of literature out there that talks about oxidative stress. And that's a valid term. But they say oxidative stress causes disease. Well, yes and no. What oxidative stress is, is the disease. You have no disease in any cell in your body that is anything more than which biomolecules in which concentration in which array are oxidized. That's the unique stamp of that disease in that cell. If you're able to come in, stop the new oxidation, repair the old oxidation with vitamin C, lo and behold, your disease begins to resolve. There's no, for example, Parkinson's cell or Alzheimer's cell or myofibri myofibralgia cell that has some exotic disease in it other than the unique array of biomolecules that are oxidized. And that has come to the fore more and more and more now since we're in the pandemic. And I'm seeing with different protocols that I put together that you pretty much resolve any condition when you concentrate on the things that are needed to get the highest concentrations of vitamin C possible inside the cell. Once that's achieved, you've got a normal cell. Once you reverse the negative oxidation that's present, you've got a normal cell. I really appreciate that because of the thousands of books I've read, the thousands of lectures I've heard, your book explains oxidation reduction the very best. For anybody out there who wants to understand root cause, it's it's so clear in your book, Dr. Levy. And, and then, of course, in uh, Hidden Epidemic, you talk about uh, toxins and root cause of 
of oral microbes that that go to other parts of the body and and cause their extreme havoc. So I, I want want us to uh, I want you to expand on um, you know the teeth, the gums, you know sure. tonsils. Oh my gosh, was that an eye opener for me? Tonsils. Uh, you have a it, I quote you in the book as, as saying the body doesn't see itself as isolated parts, and you know that that's the message for all healthcare. Uh, and for all people to find uh, healthcare professionals that will address that. So, so tell us, um, you know, I guess just, you know, start with, start with teeth, start with, start with root canals. Um, just fascinating. Uh, you know, the focal infection uh, theory has been around, but the, the, the medical establishment, the dental establishment has aggressively tried to push it back. Uh, I don't think it can be pushed back any longer because we have DNA now. So we can, we can know exactly what's going on. Um, tell us more. It's your book is fascinating. Well, to start off in a nutshell, if you have a completely healthy mouth, you've got a healthy body. That's how important. Thank you. What's going on at the mouth is for the rest of your body. I mean, it's. I have oof, tears it's... in my eyes because of you saying that. Thank you. <laughs> now, and the thing is, is we have a lot of hard research to support this. This isn't just some crazy ravings because I think it sounds neat or something like that. With regard to root canals and with regard to asymptomatically infected teeth, um, and that's a very incredibly enough common condition when we started getting our sophisticated testing, the cone beam examination, there were lots of panorex regular x-rays that we saw that looked okay right we didn't see any pathology and we did the cone beam and we saw clear radiolucent areas at the apex of the tooth which take away the crazy word radiolucency you see this dark area at the tip of the tooth it's an abscess right plain and simple i mean you can you can think of other sophisticated things to call it based on pathology but it's an abscess Filled and, with bacteria. And right there, common <laughs> sense <laughs> tells you that an abscess anywhere in your body unaddressed is going to continually, nonstop, 24-7 poison you. And what is it poisoning you with? It poisons you with uh, toxic bacteria, viruses, and fungi, the whole ball of wax, along with their prooxidant or toxic metabolic byproducts, okay, and when they finally die, they break down and release large amounts of free iron because that's what fuels a pathogen. And free iron is highly prooxidant. Prooxidant equal toxin, toxin equal prooxidant. So when you have any infection ongoing in your mouth, it's a nonstop steady supply through the venous blood that drains your tooth and through the lymphatic drainage that drains the tooth. And that's important for the ladies with breast cancer. Right. But just the venous drainage gets everywhere throughout your body. And probably the most dramatic, and there's been a lot of good literature on this, the most dramatic study that I can think of that clearly nails down this concept is I think in 2006, a Dr. Ott, O-T-T, -T, did a series of angiograms on known patients with coronary artery disease, 36, I believe, 36 individuals. And he did it with the idea that he was going to go in and do what's called an atherectomy, where you just go into and you have a device like a rotor rooter, actually. Uh -huh. You go in, you go in with an arterial rotor rooter and scrape out the plaque to open up, to open up the artery. However, in addition to doing that, he analyzed everything that he scraped out of those arteries. In it, he found 50 different types of bacteria, fungi, viruses, other microbes, protozoa, you name it. And they all, or most of them, I should say, were clearly attributable to a dental or oral origin the mm -hmm. classical type of pathogens that you see in the mouth. Now, he saw this in 36 out of 36 of his patients. 
-hmm. which as I like to say, tongue in cheeks, pretty doggone close to 100%. Right. <laughs> and the thing is, it's precisely this array of pathogens that colonizes. And that brings us to another important concept that I've been expanding on in recent days called chronic pathogen colonization. It's very common to have chronic pathogen colonization, even when you feel well and your breath is fine and you don't have a sore throat, in your nose and throat. And this is what contributes to a lot of bowel dysfunction uh, and chronic conditions, chronic COVID, because you're continuing to swallow these pathogens 24-7 mm -hmm. and you keep the gut deranged. But with regard to the coronary artery, you have the same situation, actually, that you have in the nose and throat, but it's in the lining of the coronary artery. So then this brings us, incidentally, the title of the book asserts that these dental infections account for close to 100% of coronary artery disease. I would say well over 95%, okay? And this is because, number one, we have Dr. Ott's studies that shows that these coronary arteries have plaque in them that are just teeming with pathogens from the mouth. And number two, when those pathogens are in the arterial wall itself, which, which they have to be in order to build the plaque that's filled with the dental pathogens, then we come back to vitamin C, okay? Vitamin C is your ultimate antioxidant in the body. Pathogens produce the most potent Prooxidants or toxins. And when you can't kill them, they continue to promote it 24 7. So, what happens is in the arterial wall, when you have the pathogens chronically living there, not, not like an active infection, but they're just like a, like a colony on a, on a, on a plate, uh -huh. they're, they're living yeah. there. And in the process, they're consuming all of the vitamin C present inside the blood vessel. Oh. So you actually have a blood vessel that goes into a state of chronic focal scurvy. And this that is what is caused coronary artery disease. Because, say, so, well, what does that mean? Why, why does that cause plaques to grow? Well, <clears throat> when you have a total depletion of vitamin C anywhere, by definition, you have inflammation. Wherever vitamin C goes down, inflammation goes up. This is why vitamin C is your ultimate anti-inflammatory agent. It's at the root. Oxidative stress causes inflammation. Oxidative stress consumes vitamin C. So the less vitamin C you have, the more inflammation. Now, what does inflammation trigger? Inflammation triggers an immune response. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have an acute insult to an artery let's say you have a one time one time exposure of pathogens and you have an acute immune response what does that immune response do the very first cell that comes to a site of acute inflammation is the monocyte the macrophage why is that significant well that cell has a higher concentration of vitamin c in it than any other cell in the body it's got 8,000% more vitamin C in it than the blood. So, so to the rescue. There, to yeah. the rescue, uh -huh. exactly. So it's kind of like, what's the best thing to do to this place that's becoming disease-ridden because there's not enough vitamin C in there? It's the cell comes in and brings the vitamin C in. And if your pathogen exposure at one time, that would resolve it. The acute inflammatory response would take care of that and everything would be fine. But this is a chronic ongoing seeding. It never stops. So the acute inflammatory response becomes the chronic inflammatory response. And that's where you start getting into plaque building. The chronic inflammatory response, in addition to the regular immune cells, brings in fibroblasts and other things that start to try to build new tissue because what does vitamin C do in the blood vessel wall? It helps sustain normal connective tissue and collagen to keep the, keep the wall of the artery strong. So if you've completely lost all the vitamin C in that, you're not making collagen, then 
the wall can become weak and start to dilate and presumably, if nothing's done, eventually rupture. So everything the body does, it tries to prevent something catastrophic. So nothing could be more catastrophic than an aneurysm on your coronary mm -hmm. artery due to loss of connective tissue rupturing. You bleed out and you die. So how would you then beg a question? If you don't have vitamin C, and you're not going to get enough vitamin C in there to build this new, what's the only other way that you're going to give that arterial wall any sort of strength and buffer against expanding and rupturing? And that is by building up new substance, new thickness. And that's the huh. atherosclerotic plaque. The atherosclerotic plaque, in a nutshell, is the body's compensatory mechanism right. of strengthening the artery because it cannot strengthen the artery with normal connective tissue because the vitamin C is gone. Exactly. Our bodies are designed to heal. So that's our body trying to heal is what you're saying, right? And if you take away its mechanisms of healing, it has to come up with compensatory responses or just let you die. And in this case, the compensatory response is actually the plaque, because it thickens the blood, it thickens the blood vessel at that area. Okay, so if if you what's what's the only thing that can help a thin, weakened arterial wall that you can't strengthen, and that would be a thickened arterial wall. Right, reinforcing uh, it. Exactly. So so when we have these toxins at the base, at the root cause, they're eating up all the vitamin C. So. People are just getting depleted so quickly, correct? Is that right? And, and so this brings us back to, okay, now we, we have all the clear evidence that these pathogens are chronically living inside the coronary artery. We actually have the, the microscopic and the toxin status as established by Dr. Ott in his study. We know it's there. And incidentally, this was all in cardiology journals, so I don't right. know. I, I don't think cardiologists or, or probably any other medical, medical subspecialty reads their own journals. Or if they do, it doesn't sink in. Or they have no inclination to do something on their own, no matter how well established it might be in the le medical literature. I like to say good facts go into the medical literature to die. And that's and that's why I write my books. The books, the books uh -huh. will live on long past me, and hopefully still be around. And other people will pick up on them and, and expand on the concepts. So anyway, we have these pathogens in the coronary artery. And we know they're coming from the mouth. Where are they coming from in the mouth? Well, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, you have infected, inflamed gums. And there's a host of information. I mean, huh. infected and inflamed gums are correlated with every disease oh. known. And and they just That's what like I see to every use day. the word correlate, but forget correlate. It's forget cause. Correlate. It's cause and effect. It is. You clear up the gums mm -hmm. in many people, you clear up a lot of their conditions. Unless, unless, of course, those infected gums have led to infected teeth, which, of course, is a natural progression. When you keep infected gums for a long enough period of time, the pathogens work their way down uh, along the gum and tooth line until they reach the apex of the tooth, colonize, and eventually form the asymptomatic abscess we talked about earlier. Of course, root canals, and this is 100% solid, but still obviously denied by anybody who wants to do a root canal, is 100%, 100% of root canals are infected, okay? There is no such thing as an uninfected root canal. Very early on, Dr. Hal Huggins and Dr. Boyd Haley got together, Dr. Boyd Haley from the University of Kentucky, professor there who worked with toxins. Dr. Huggins arranged to have, through his network of dentists around the country, send Dr. Haley every root canal that they extracted around the country. And I don't know how long it took, probably a couple of years, I suppose, because it ultimately resulted in over 5,000 teeth being sent to Dr. Haley. Dr. Haley found inside those teeth routinely toxins that were present that were, by the parameters of his test, 
many fold more toxic than botulism, which modern medicine, quote unquote, considers to be your most toxic substance known. Anyway, not only were these present, various amounts, that's the one thing, depending on your unique microbial or pathogen flora in your mouth, you could have a greater toxicity or a lesser toxicity, but you always have a toxicity. So he found that 100% of these teeth were highly toxic, and they actually did this testing on a few teeth removed for orthodontic purposes, no, no indication of infection, and they had none of these toxins. So it wasn't some sort of contamination as the toxin, as the tooth was extracted from the mouth. So you have the infected gums, you have root canals, you have a chronically abscessed teeth, sinuses, we've actually, there's actually information that shows incredibly enough that I don't think the ear, nose, and throat people still appreciate this, the physicians, is that some 70% of chronic sinusitis is related to an infected upper jawbone maxillary tooth. Uh -huh. Oh, I totally so, agree. So, so how many ENT doctors, when somebody comes in with the chronic sniffles, sends them to the dentist to see if they have an infected tooth in their upper jaw? I right. think pretty much close to none. Pretty much okay. zero, Dr. Pretty Reed. much zero. Okay. In fact, so, uh, an interesting uh, clinical story that happened to me, a, a guy came in uh, saying he had a horrible taste in his mouth. And um, so I got close and smelled and couldn't smell anything. He said, nobody can smell it, but I'm so worried about my horrible halitosis. Um, his wife even called me and said, I think he's got halitophobia. I think he's got a <laughs> mental instant, uh, mental condition. Uh, so I, anyway, took a 3D cone beam, as you mentioned, on this guy. He had two root canals in his front teeth that had giant abscesses on the lingual side. Now that, for our listeners, is the side on the back side of the tooth. So on a 2D x-ray, they would look fine. So you have to go through that tooth to see what's really there in all three planes. And so, um, you know, I just... I do oral systemic evaluation and uh, oral microbiology. So I sent him to a, um, a doctor to have those teeth out, get implants, and his taste immediately, his smell to himself immediately uh, right. became optimal. So, you know, it, there's always a cause, and I think you even say that in your book, uh, every biological event occurs for a reason. That's and correct. And I think we we overlook that in medicine. We treat symptoms and we forget that there's always um, a reason, a, an independent risk factor uh, for, for that situation. And I so appreciate that you use the word cause because as a, a physician and as um, a, an attorney, you realize how strong the word cause is. I mean, so, but you give proof for that, um, you know, in, in your book, uh, Tell our readers, um, Dr. Levy, you have a gift for making the difficult simple. And um, that shows what a, an in-depth un understanding you have to be able to, to make it clear. Tell about the reference range versus the normal range versus the optimal range on lab testing. Okay, sure. Uh, but let me first add to the end of what I said before, because I talked about the gums, infected teeth, sinuses and infected tonsils, okay? And that might be something we'll address in more detail later, but uh, everyone who sees this should realize that anytime you've had an infected tooth in your mouth, root canal or asymptomatic abscess tooth, you're gonna have chronically infected tonsils, no matter how good they look, okay? Dr. Joseph Issels established this a long time ago, and I'll go into more detail in that, but Anybody who wants to take care of their heart by addressing oral infections must include an, a treatment approach to the tonsils, okay, because they're always infected no matter what they look like. Now, with regard to, well, actually, truth be known, it's the people, the, the physicians, uh, dentists, healthcare professionals that utilize laboratory data that see the range on the laboratory test, and they call it the normal range. The laboratory doesn't call it the normal range. The laboratory calls it the mm -hmm. reference range. Because what happens in 
all data is you got to remember you generate what we call normal limits by looking at a large number of people. And you hopefully get the bell-shaped curve where you group most of the people right in the middle, and then you have the two lows and the two highs on the, on the ends of it. The problem is when you have blood work done on a population of people or a subset of people that have pretty much the same chronic medical problems, there's no way you're going to ferret out a normal range from them because the vast majority of them already have a normal value. So you ultimately end up pulling in astronomical levels of one particular test, but because most of that population had levels close to that, that's officially in your upper range of normal. When in point of fact, it just means a very large percentage of the population, as we're talking about with these dental infections, coronary artery disease, cholesterols, all of those things is very difficult to know uh, what they would be in a truly normal non-infected population. Oh, exactly. In an optimal, in optimal metabolic health. It's right. so different. I joke on my podcast all the time and listeners know I talk about, you know, uh, normal is constipated, irritated, frustrated <laughs> over, you know, I go through this whole thing because normal is only what is typical in a society at the time. So, you know, we would have to look at normal as, um, overweight, normal as, as exhausted, normal as terrified, you know, normal is not the way we want to live our life. At normal all. as needing antacids all day long. Exactly. Exactly. And I hear every day from, uh, most of my patients are referred by physicians, functional medicine physicians. So these are people who've been going to the dentist every six months and they've been told that their gums bleed, but that's normal. So Jeez. I hear that every single day in clinic. So I have to sort of do my dance to say, well, that may be normal because that's typical, but that is not optimal. And it's, you know, impacting your, that's a good you know, way of putting it. It's typical, but it's not optimal because sad to say, and I know you obviously realize this more than anybody else. You can't come off with your patients as being in any way insulting or degrading right. to the people that referred them in. Right. You well, know? The, <laughs> yes. you know, the physicians that refer them, they get it. They are right. They are on top of it and they're seeing high C-reactive protein numbers. You, know, you talk about that in your book for the listeners. That's a measure of, of inflammation um, that is predictive of heart attack and stroke and all kinds Absolutely. of other problems, cancer, including cancer. And, um, so, so they get it, but I have to be so careful with, uh, the patient and their relationship with their dentist that they've had for 10 years or 15 years. And so, um, because it, it really matters. I want them to get well. And hearing that story you told about in Dr. Huggins clinic about the woman that had the vitamin C, I mean, I just got all teary in that. I've already teared up twice talking to you. Good grief. This is because we got into medicine to help people. That's, that's why we. Well, some, uh, some healthcare practitioners have got into medicine to help people. Yeah. <laughs> you're, and that's you're, being people too, you're being much too, especially in light of everything we've seen in the pandemic. Oof. A majority of physicians, at least, do not put the welfare of their patient as their number one consideration. I'm sorry, it just ain't true. Oh, I'm so appreciate that about you. And I mean, your book is incredible. Let's go back to tonsils. Tell me more about that. Now, Dr. Levy, I don't know if you remember when I pulled you out. I was, I, you know, met you years ago at the uh, A4M conference, but then I saw you last year at an ozone conference. And, you know, like, pulled you over to my table to have lunch with us. And um, you sort of touched on the tonsil situation. Then I told you about a, a recent diagnosis I'd had of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. I have zero symptoms. The diagnosis was only based on a, an early, early uh, flow cytometry test. But you told me at the table, get your tonsils out. And I remember just like, ah, and I haven't done it yet. But in rereading your book, I mean, I think I'm going to have to do it. It sounds very painful, but, um, you know, kind of just review the, the reasoning for that. I, I, I believe it. Well, we might have some new options for you since then. Okay. Good. 
good. I'm a wimp, so I, I uh, but, need options. Uh, yes, I because I did have my tonsils out as an adult, and I the most miserable experience of my life, you know, uh, dealing with the next month of swallowing and eating and everything like that. But at the time, I didn't have any alternatives, and my CRP was staying high, and I had some chest discomfort, and I knew that I was going to just become another statistic if I kept them in my mouth. Now, why did I think it was the tonsils? That goes back to the work of Dr. Joseph Issels in the 1950s and 60s. Dr. Issels, who's uh, in the Orthomolecular Medicine Hall of Fame, I might add, is a phenomenally brilliant uh, German physician. He did spend a lot of time his later life in the United States. He ran a clinic for basically advanced metastatic cancer patients in Germany, mostly patients who had exhausted all their money, exhausted treatments, been brutalized by chemotherapy, surgery, everything imaginable, and, and they were on their end stage. And Dr. Issel saw them all, brought them in. What he noted early on, now remember, this is in the 50s. In his own words, he said 98% had multiple infected teeth. Well, 98%, I think we can call 100%, considering the diagnostic measures they had back in the 50s versus what we have now. Mm -hmm. And so his first thing would be to properly extract all these infected teeth. This included root canals. And I, I can't imagine he probably left a number of asymptomatically infected teeth in there as well, because there's no way he could have known about them back then. But anyway, he got rid of the root canals and then began his little autoimmune program where he would make, make a vaccine from the patient themselves. It wasn't any vaccine like we, we get out of the laboratories now. He used the person's own immune system to work against their cancer and had a lot of success. But he noticed very early on that even though nearly all of his patients were getting better dramatically, even from advanced metastatic disease, a substantial number, I think he put it at about 15 to 20%, uh, a few months into their therapy would get heart attacks, uh, either fatal or just uh, have it and then recover. And this is where his brilliance came in because there were a few patients early on where he had seen, uh, for example, individuals with rheumatic disease, he saw infected tonsils and he saw when they got their tonsils treated, the rheumatism went down. Mm -hmm. But it, it was still a brilliant leap that he went to, to, to realize that the tonsils are chronically infected because they were normal size and appeared normal morphologically. So in the regular cancer patient who had multiple infected teeth, the tonsils morphologically appeared normal. It wasn't like some childhood, big, ugly, mm -hmm. inflamed tonsils. They were normal looking, normal size. Anyway, this was a pretty bold move. He started routinely doing tonsillectomies on all these cancer patients mm -hmm. when they first presented to him. And he had no more incidents of heart attack. Wow. Furthermore, furthermore, oh. in his own words, 100% of the tonsils that he was uh, extracted were grossly and highly infected upon pathology. So he was pulling out infected organs, no doubt about it. Now, what we know today is, because we do have some studies with people with chronic tonsil problems, and when you inject the tonsils with ozone, oftentimes you can get those tonsils to, if not resolve completely, resolve substantially. And in your case, uh, I don't know, I suspect maybe you have an elevated CRP too to go along with your uh, uh, it, it it was two point six last time I had it checked. Which you know, optimal's yeah. optimal's one, no, normal that's, that's, is three. So that's still yeah. too high. No, not not that's no that's reference range. That's not right, exactly yeah. reference two, range. Two point right. six is much too. Yeah, high. I want it much point five or below. Exactly. Okay, so you have that, and of course you have the uh, lymphocytic condition per se. Those will be your direct agents upon which to see what your clinical response is to the ozone injections. 
if they completely resolve the infection, uh, the lymphocytic problem should go away and the CRP should normalize. Now, one other thing, and this is going to come out of left field for you, but uh, is methylene blue. Methylene blue is one of the most phenomenal antioxidants right up there. It rivals vitamin C and everything that it does. But even better than vitamin C, it gets everywhere in the body so quickly, so rapidly. And without going into a large amount of detail in it, I don't want to aside into something completely different for you, except to say that it's probably the singular most potent anti-infection agent I've ever seen. I mean, you you start to get a scratchy throat, you take a dose, a few hours later, it's gone. I mean, it's, it's that dramatic for a lot of people. However, in the case of it, and being a dye, methylene blue, it was originally designed. It's actually a drug. It's not a orthomolecular substance. It was the first drug ever synthesized and tested on humans. That's That's its niche, if you will. Wow. But it's used as a biological staining agent because it's so, I mean, it'll it'll show you the lymphatic tracts on a cancer. It'll show you where the cancer goes. So it's very good for surgeons in mapping out their surgeries. But it's also that very feature shows you how readily it diffuses and gets into tissues. If in addition to your ozone, you get a Q-tip, and soak it with a little methylene blue, and then you daub the tonsils directly, okay? Or if possible too, and this is perfectly fine and maybe even desirable, if there's easy access, uh, your a fellow dentist, your husband, somebody else can just take an eye, a dropper and just put a drop or two directly on the surface of the tonsils. And you'll be amazed at how well this penetrates and resolves infections. So I would definitely do those two measures at this point in time before going straight to the tonsillectomy. But if you do the ozone a bunch and you do the methylene blue a bunch and you have no real change in your CRP a few months down the road, I would strongly encourage you to go ahead and get the tonsillectomy. Now, mind you too, in my particular case, it was miserable, but I was taking care of myself. I mean, if I'd have been, if I'd have been able to go home and and get an intravenous vitamin C every day, this out of the other, I'm sure I'd have been up and at them three weeks earlier than I was uh, and reducing all the post-operative inflammation at all. But I was actually the care giver for my elderly mother at the time. So I was taking care of her while trying to get myself out of misery. So I don't want to, so I'm not going to say it's a pleasant surgery. Absolutely. But I mean, if you, if you have everything arranged, good bed rest, IV vitamin C, lipospheric vitamin C from live on, uh, along with some hydrocortisone, which really works to get the vitamin C concentrations high wherever you go. That's all part of these current protocols that we're using to defeat the spike protein in COVID. Uh, I think I think you'll come through the surgery very, very quickly and very, very easily. So I shouldn't over promote my experience because of the things that I was unable to do for myself. I mean, it's 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 very difficult being an extremely sick patient and giving yourself optimal therapy. So <laughs> well, doesn't yeah, work that well. Doctors aren't often not that good at treating themselves because uh, you just treat, help everybody else. That is such logical um, information. Thank you so much uh, for my, for my listeners. You all know that when I was diagnosed, um, I'm totally subclinical, but the oncologist said, I don't want to see you till you're sick. So I hope this information encourages all of you to know that there are things that you can do for yourself um, in in the last year and a half, I've, I've had ozone. I've had vitamin C, 50 grams. Um, we've done the fasting mimicking diet. I've normalized my blood glucose, several things. And actually, uh, those, um, bad leukemic cells have were at 2% and they're now at 1%. So these strategies, uh, get your body back yeah. to where it needs to be and they work. And the vitamin C will knock it down. I mean, I was tracking uh, elevated CRP for years 
before I had the chest pain that led me to go ahead and get the tonsils taken out. And when I'd go intensely on the IV vitamin C, I'd see the CRP come back down, but then it would bounce back up again. So in other words, like Dr. Huggins said, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. So you can That's work right. on the damage that was done, but you're not doing anything if you're not addressing what's causing the new damage. That's ultimately that's right, and that's you, the you that's the address that. that's the oral infection that um so attracted me to your to you and to your uh, to your writing. It's just really um, grassroots medicine, and I think you know here again we want we want to promote uh, patients to feel empowered, you know for for taking control of their own health. Sure, sure, sure. I, I'm writing an article on the methylene blue right now that I'm going to give to the orthomecular medicine news because I know this catches a lot of people off guard, but I got to say, for example, as an anti-infective agent, they have articles in the literature, believe it or not, prospective articles that show that methylene blue helps rescue and resolved advanced cases of COVID in the ICU with acute respiratory distress syndrome and cytokine storm. All of the things where they're just getting ready to die and methylene blue will still bail them out. So this is an, a profoundly positive agent. And obviously if it works on an infection like that, it can work very well on a little old focal infection in the tonsils. Ah, oh, incredible. Thank you so much. Um, how can our listeners uh, find your more of your information? I know you've uh, so generously given me links to books for free. So uh, you all can go to my website and find links to Dr. Levy's uh, many books, including this hidden epidemic that we've discussed today. So that's at drdebbieosmond.com. I know, Dr. Levy, you're at peakenergy.com, B E A K. E N E R G Y dot com, but tell us what you offer um, at your website. I'm very impressed. Well, a whole host of articles. Uh, there's also a reference list. People are always asking, well, where do I go find a doctor? Where do I go find a dentist? Where do I go find uh, this type of service or ozone or this out of the other? And as best I can, I have a list of links. I mean, most of the time when people email email me. Um, I give them those links, but ultimately they have to be their own investigator in tracking something down, going online, typing right. in biological dentist, and not necessarily taking the first one. I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, most people, if they, if like, let's say they call your office, okay, and they say, well, Dr. Osmond, I really need this, but but you're 150 miles away from me. Do you have a colleague that's a little bit closer? I'm sure you'd be more than happy to tell them anybody that's closer to them. So, so people shouldn't should understand. I think that as a group, biological dentists are strongly allied colleagues who, who who know that they have plenty to do, and it's perfectly fine to refer them to a colleague so that somebody's not doing extensive dental work and then facing a five hour drive in their car. Right. No, I think, I think really everybody in this, in this space of functional medicine, integrative medicine, um, we're all just looking for answers for people. I'm not officially a biological dentist. Um, I do oral microbiome and help people with their, you know, I always say the health starts in the gut, but the gut starts in the mouth. And so um, I, I, I started start North of that, but I'm, you know, I've gotten acquainted with all the biological dentists in probably a 200 mile radius of Oklahoma city. And we all just want to help each other. We just all want to help people find answers. And that's what you've done so completely through your books, through your articles, through your speaking. I heard you speak at the ozone conference and um, I, I just can't thank you enough for spending time today with me. And I hope we can do it again um, and just glean more of your incredible information, Dr. Levy. Thank you so much. Also, I'm very open with anybody listening to have my email, not that I can do consultations, I don't do those, but people who are interested who might have a question, I can put them together with different information sources, sometimes different people, uh, and I'm perfectly willing to do that. And also, I have a whole list of uh, articles and even ebooks that anybody that sends an email, I can give them the link to. So I'm more than happy to do that. But like I said, don't 
Don't send me an email and say, this is my medical history. What do I do? Okay. Right. And that, and that of course, as you know, is T.E. Levy, M.D. at Yahoo.com. E.E. Levy. No, T.E. Thomas E. T. Yeah, Thomas Edward. You're Thomas Edward, right? Right. right. So T.E. L-E-B-Y. M.D. M.D. At Yahoo.com. At Yahoo.com. Thank you. You're so generous. And you're so, once again, you're so brave and curious. Stay curious. We need your information. We need your insight. We need your experience. Thank you, Dr. Levy. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Osmond. Thank you all for joining me today. Join me for more episodes of Vitality Made Simple. It's the podcast that's going, going to empower you to live younger, longer, and to more fully enjoy all of the relationships in your life. It's all about relationships. Thank you.